It's a windy day here at the car races. In Daytona, that would be a bad thing. But here in Milford, Utah, it's a great thing. Hi, I'm Chad Booth. Welcome to the County Seat, the show that's about local government, not local politics. And students from area high schools are powering electric race cars. It's part of the Renewable Energy Fair that's sponsored by SUTREC. This is the fifth annual event where students and renewable energy industry leaders get together and compare notes about the future opportunities and technology. It's an interactive program, and we're going to find out about that in our story today here on the county seat. We will follow that with a roundtable conversation about renewable energy and its development here in the region. You know, it all started back in 1958 when Mrs. Whitaker, one of the original wind prospector's mother, said, why not Milford as an energy hub? Well, by the end of the show, you'll find out what the answer to that question is as we look at renewable energy in the West Desert. Let's start by taking a look at this great event with the kids. So what image pops into your mind when you hear the term renewable energy? You're probably thinking about solar panels or giant wind turbines. But most people would not think of Milford, Utah, or Beaver County, or really anywhere in the state for that matter. I look at it like an alfalfa crop. We're selling alfalfa to Japan and overseas and California. We have a crop of wind, and we're selling that to California. There's world-class resources all within one valley. So they have high-quality solar resources, wind resources, geothermal, even hydropower and biomass. So there's not any place in the world that we've found that produces more power from so many different resources in such a small area as Beaver County does. So it's, that's pretty unique. We have a mecca of renewable energy within a 50-mile radius. Talk about an, an education gold mine and a development gold mine. We, we have the capabilities and the knowledge here to do it. Today, these facts are being discussed at the Milford Renewable Energy Fair. It's put on by the Southern Utah Renewable Energy Center, or SUTREC. This group of 12 agencies is working to develop renewable resources in an economically beneficial way. And it all started with a teacher who was observant. This all started with Andy Swap, Milford High School's, he's a CTE teacher there. And about 10 years ago, him and his students started to gather wind, wind speed data. That turned into the Milford Wind Farm, which is the largest wind farm in the state. And he started a renewable energy class after that. Once that class got going, he realized that other students in the state could benefit from learning about renewable energy. So we started the Milford Fair. Students come from across the state. They come, they learn about renewable energy. They race electric cars that they build. And all in all, they see that there's a future beyond what they might normally think about. This is an opportunity for them to see how other people around the area are solving these same problems. This curious device that John Christensen brought to the fair caught a lot of people's attention. It's a solar collector that students built with repurposed parts from a TV they found on the side of the road. This is a Fresnel lens. It focuses the sun's energies to anything from the size of a dinner plate down to a laser point. Today we're toasting marshmallows, but then we also do things like we'll cut steel with it, we'll weld steel together. My focus is trying to inspire my students to figure out how to make things more efficient. We have a set amount of resources on the planet. If we waste them, we're going to be in trouble. So if we can make our vehicles even a small amount more efficient, find alternate ways of conserving and using our energy, then it's going to benefit us all. The fair wraps up, surprisingly enough, with a car race. But these aren't your average cars. They are electric vehicles that student teams have engineered and built as part of their career and technical training classes. The car that has traveled the greatest distance and is still rolling after an hour is the winner. This year, the top speed was 33 miles an hour. The winning car traveled 25 miles. It is an event that we look forward to every year, but it is also a, a tremendous engineering feat just to get these cars to run to get the drivetrain lined up so the chain doesn't pop off and to uh, get the steering down correctly. And it's, it's a great engineering teaching tool 
you can teach different systems, the electrical system, the steering system, and, and whatnot. But it's huge when a student has a goal, shoots for it, and achieves it, whether it's in sports, academics, or here in the career and technical education arena. One Milford High School graduate from the class of 1958 asked the question, why not Milford? Well, perhaps one of these students will become part of that answer. For the county seat, I'm Terry Wood. Well, there you have a report on what's going on right across the alleyway here at Milford High School with SUTREK, a very interesting program that has a lot to do with our upcoming conversation on renewable energy. I might point out that we are bringing you this broadcast of the county seat totally powered by solar energy. We'll be right back with our distinguished panel to talk about renewable energy in the western part of the state when we come back with the county seat. Stay with us. Kanab, base camp for your southern Utah adventures. in Kanab. Have you ever pictured yourself as captain of your own barge, piloting the water of one of America's most famous canals? Ever wanted to walk through American history and discover adventure at the same time? Well, now you can do all of it. Join at your leisure this fall for a houseboat trip down the Erie Canal. Bring your family for a trip of a lifetime through some of the oldest parts of our country. Go to AYLTV.com for all the details at your leisure's 2013 Erie Canal Adventure. Only outdoors like never before. Unlimited opportunity for adventure. It's all about knowing where to look. ATV adventures, rock crawling events, art festivals, and wildlife events. The opportunities are limitless. Pick your adventure in Miller County. Let's be honest, you don't know much about Beaver County. Well, let me tell you about it. It's the birthplace of outlaw Butch Cassidy and inventor Philo T. Farnsworth. Some of the best skiing in Utah is at Eagle Point. You've got camping, Canyon Breeze Golf Course, Crusher and the Tushers, Beaver Territorial Courthouse, Snowmobiling, Renewable Energy, Pioneer Car Show, Squeaky Cheese, Ghost Towns to Explore, Best Water in the Country, Paiute ATV Trails, Old Frisco Kilns, Horse Racing, Hunting, Fishing, and it's a good place to live. Beaver County, mountains of fun. I could tell you more, but why don't you come and see it for yourself? Welcome back to the county seat. Our topic today is renewable energy in the western part of the state of Utah. I didn't want to say the West Desert because actually it's a much larger corridor than that. Joining us for our discussion, Commissioner Mark Whitney, a Beaver County Commissioner, Brian Harris, Development Manager for the First Wind Project here in Utah, and Jim Gazewood, the BLM Renewable Energy Program Coordinator. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. What has really spurred the development of renewable energy here in Utah? Renewable energy, it, it wouldn't move forward with, without some type of demand. So there needs to be some, some demand for the projects to move forward. That demand is generally created by um, state policy at, at, different, at different state levels. Um, across the West, there are, there are some states, most states um, have developed policies that require a certain amount of their electricity to come from renewable. And that definitely creates, creates that demand. And, and then the other, the other thing that goes along with, with energy development is, is the cost of the project. And the cost of renewable energy projects, um, particularly wind and solar, have come down tremendously over the last five years, and it continues to go down. Um, the, the local, in, or the, sorry, the federal incentives um, that have encouraged that have really been beneficial, um, but, but the, both wind and solar are, are, are coming down to where um, those subsidies are not are not as um, quite as necessary as they, as they were in the past. Certainly, as we talked about, and Brian just mentioned, uh, certain state policies that are that are requiring a certain amount of their energies that are uh, brought into their states be renewable green type energies. And so, with that being said, uh, a lot of the rural areas, uh, such as the Southwest uh, 
Utah and even in, in even some of the other rural areas, uh, we're on public lands that basically produce uh, no revenues other than PILT payments to counties. And so therefore, uh, the renewable energies such as solar, wind, is great taxation and great revenues and job creators for our rural counties. And so the, they work hand in hand with the public policy of the demand for the energy. So, uh, you know, you can, you can weigh the odds as to whether or not, you know, what cost you put at it. Because yes, there is a direct cost with the infrastructure of putting in the transmission line. But as Brian said, the costs are coming down, but it's also revenue sources and keeping our children in the, lo the rural areas at home. And th I think this is a good point to take a break because there's a lot to say about transmission line, a lot of questions people have. We're gonna take a break from the county seat. We'll be back with our conversation on renewable energy in just a minute. What brings you to St. George? Business meeting. Staying long? Just here for the day. Quick in and out. Hey, I just landed. Can we meet in half an hour? Not oh, too bad. Why so fast? Stay any longer? We'll run out of things to do. On second thought. <sighs> Buddy, something's come up. I'm going to need another hour. Can we push the meeting till noon? I am definitely going to need to reschedule. Holy... Sit back, relax, and enjoy your 45-minute flight to Salt Lake. How'd that meeting go? I should have booked a weekend. Carbon County is typically known for its industry and coal production. But that is not all. Utah's Castle Country has something for everyone. It is the home of the nationally recognized North Springs Shooting Range. North Springs provides gun hobbyists and professionals a practice and training facility that is second to none. Visit castlecountry.com for more information. Almost 45% of the oil produced in Utah, 7.8 million barrels, comes from Duchesne County. That oil feeds our state economy, provides job growth, and supports local business. Here in Duchesne County, we're working to make Utah an economic, cultural, and technological leader. Whether you're here for business or pleasure, Duchesne County will welcome you with open arms and invite you to explore all the beauty of the Uinta Mountains. Duchesne County, close enough for business, far enough to get away. Welcome back to the county seat. Our topic today is renewable energy. In the West, we have been talking about uh, the, the policy that has developed this energy out here, and we are now going to turn our attention to if you build it, you still have to plug it in because they won't come. You've got to get it delivered to the household. So I, wanted, I want to turn our attention to transmission lines. This is one of the biggest problems that renewable faces is getting their stuff into the electrical grid or system. How are you handling that? Well, traditionally, um, the, 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 the grid, uh, the electrical grid in the United States is developed around um, coal and natural gas plants and the population centers. And so the renewable energy um, development is focused on trying to find some of those transmission lines that, that aren't completely to capacity and then putting the renewable energy on, on those lines. Um, but, but the key is that there needs to be available capacity to get the tram to get the electricity to the to the power well so so basically a, a transmission line is is kind of like a, an oil or gas pipeline it can only carry so much electricity at any given time correct and and so you're trying to find those areas that have a little extra space but then but then renewables aren't constant in their output are they they're not they're not so so the the transmission lines needs to be able to carry the the maximum capacity that renewable energy project will put out what happens when they're tapped 
Well, then we get into circumstances like uh, the major wind developments that are occurring in Wyoming. Uh, the Choke Cherry of Sierra Madre project is a good example, 3,000 megawatts, 1,000 turbines, where that particular entity has worked to capitalize the creation of large transmission to get it to where it needs to go that actually is crossing Utah, the Transwest Express. Mm -hmm. There are similar initiatives that are in play. As you mentioned, Chad, once those pipelines are full, then they have to create new infrastructure on top. And uh, so those have been drivers that we're seeing the real effects of here in Utah. And, and when we done our planning process several years ago on our general plan, we saw that potential of needing these uh, uh, corridors for these transmission lines. So we specifically made a particular area to where the lines can come through. And what Jim's talking about right now, there is two more new big transmission lines strictly for green power. The Zephyr line and, as he said, the TransWest line, which will uh, take power to Nevada. Las Vegas in particular and into Southern California. So these are all in the works because as, as Brian said in his earlier statements, uh, some of the traditional uh, transmission lines are old and they're their capacity. So they've got to be built. So when you have critics of, of transmission lines, really some of the older lines are at a point where they may have to be upgraded or renewed anyway. So we're talking about putting dollars in, but it's not necessarily dollars that wouldn't still have to be spent if we kept with traditional sources of fuel, is that correct? Exactly. It is correct, and, 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 that, and that's again where the critics talk uh, when you talk driving the cost of, of, of renewable energy. A lot of that has to do with the upfront capital cost of these transmission lines and with the traditional uh, power, coal power plants, natural gas plants, and those uh, transmission lines, some of those are 40, 50, 60 years old and have already been paid for. So there is a cost up front. Uh, part of this is to recognize the type of transmission that's in play. In some cases, some of these are DC lines or DC infrastructure that are made for efficiencies on long distances. Those don't provide a real means for renewable development here locally when we have wind development needs, needs to plug in. Uh, the DC infrastructure is very expensive and it's geared towards long distance. But other lines, as an example, the Cigarette to Red Butte, uh, which is an AC line, lends itself where, uh, well so that if there are uh, renewable projects that are in close proximity, they can create the short lines to tap into that. If I may just t tie back the transmission to the potential of <coughs> renewable energy projects, um, the potential is really tied to to the, the, the demand, um, and whether there's going to be demand or not in the state of Utah. And if there is demand for the projects, um, the project developers will figure out a way to get the electricity to the to the center of where the power is, is needed. And you know, some of the, the projects can support certain amount of transmission. You know, they can build certain um, amount of transmission along with the project. Um, and with the price of power coming down, that's that's feasible. But it's it's all tied back to to the demand for the for the product, which is the electricity. Well, Mark, you deal in county government with a lot of small communities. How do these communities prepare for the technological change that's going to come with becoming a big power center? Well, and again, a lot of this is, is modern technology and education, uh, such as right now with this renewable energy uh, fair, and a lot of the kids that Andy Swap here in Milford High School prepares these children and with Sutrek to educate them, to educate some of us older dummies that really don't know what's going on, and to help us with the, with the process on that. And I think Brian can probably weigh in on some other ways that First Wind uh, contributes to that. We have 22, 22 high-tech jobs that are in, in the community, and that doesn't sound like a whole lot of jobs, but for a, a rural community like Milford, that's, that's a big impact. It's huge. And it's been a tremendous, in, tremendous positive impact for the community of Milford. If, this, if, if we can tap geothermal, solar, and wind energy out in this corridor, is there an exponential growth in that 22 number of jobs for the communities around, you know, you know the, the enterprises and the Milfords and the, uh, you know, Adamsvilles and all the little towns? Is that, is that potential here for all of them to tie into that? It, it, cer it certainly is. Um, the, the project here in Milford um, could definitely be replicated in, in other parts of the state, um, in, you know, in, in the southeastern part of the state, the northwestern part of the state, um, definitely. Chad, I could add, too, uh, that it's important to understand that 
with projects of this nature, whether it's the generation facilities or the transmission, the cool thing about this is, is to recognize we have different phases of employment or potential or impact to the local communities. In the case of planning, uh, we've got environmental contractors and survey work that's got to be done to make sure that these things are located and done in a fashion that'll you know, protect resources. Then you've got the construction aspect where you've got there's folks that come in. Hundreds of jobs hundreds of jobs construction. for construction. And, and as Brian had mentioned, support jobs as well. Uh, the third environment being the operational uh, staffs that are involved with maintaining and operating those facilities. So there's three phases that are important for our local economy, uh, local uh, communities to be aware of. And because each one brings its own uh, positive impacts as well as in some cases uh, concerns, challenges. Absolutely. I mean from the very beginning from the construction phase of, of first wind uh, even going back to when they built the uh, Blundell geothermal plant you know the, the economic impact to the little towns like Milford uh, is just phenomenal. That money that is spent at a local basis you know to the to the local businesses is phenomenal and as Brian mentioned 22 jobs may not seem like a lot of jobs to the Wasatch Front, but to Milford, Beaver, County, uh, even Enterprise area. I'll give you an, an example. One of my good friends and commissioners, Commissioner Leland Pollock out of Garfield County, would die and do anything to have 22 new jobs in Garfield County. So there's a lot of potential here uh, for this in our, in our rural areas. And he does bribe them with really good popcorn. I no no doubt about it. <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's John Wayne coffee. <laughs> That's right. Listen, we will take a break here from the county seat. A really good conversation on renewable energy. We will be back with our solar powered show right here from Milford High School in just a minute when we return. The best part about raising children here in, the, in Vernal and the Una Basin is just the smaller community that makes you feel like when you go somewhere you know everybody. It's not too big, it's not too small. We're close to the Wasatch Front if there's anything we need out there. The support is unbelievable. Even though you don't have a kid playing in high school football, you go to Friday Night Football. My job has offered me the ability to uh, college educate all three of my children. My father, he was an engineer for Chevron, retired 39 some odd years. And Jeff, my husband, it's the same way. He's always worked in the old guest, always had a job here. It's a wonderful place to, to play because there's a lot of variety between hunting, fishing. And the beautiful mountains and flaming gorge is just a short distance away. It's one of the big reasons why I live where I live is I'm able to run up to a beautiful place like this and spend some good quality time. There's always plenty to do in, uh, in Uinta County. Rediscover your sense of adventure. Welcome to San Juan County. Discover the past. A change of place. Utah, San Juan County, where life is elevated. In San Rafael Country, you'll discover more adventure and excitement than you can imagine. And it's only two hours from the Wasatch Front. Find gorges that descend thousands of feet, trails that go on forever, and the solitude of finding a place all your own. Emory County and the San Rafael Swell. We're closer than you think. Welcome back to the county seat. We are, our solar powered show is being brought to you from Milford High School, as we've mentioned throughout the half hour. All this bright light and this electronic equipment is being run by large solar panels right outside this building. So it is truly a renewable show. Uh, we, in the break, we were talking about the cycle or wave because in the uh, oil and gas uh, communities across the state, it's boom or bust. You have this big you know, construction boom and then there's a maintenance and you have another boom. And we were wondering if that really is going to apply to renewable energy and what kind of impacts it's going to have on the county if you have a whole bunch of construction jobs and then there's only a few maintenance jobs to keep them running. Well, I mean, th there is somewhat of a similarity, but, but, it, but, it, but not really. Um, for example, we have, we have a construction project, more than an, an ongoing oil boom. So it's a construction project, and a lot of the, we, we do hire as many local people as possible, but some of the, the technical construction jobs, you know, they're, they're from people that are brought in, they, they're, they're not 
they don't move to the community. They just come to the community for, for a, for a six-month to one-year job. Um, so they're really not integrated into the community um, and, and then leave. They're, they're really just here temporarily for that job. But one of the, the really good pos positive impacts of the, of the project is, we, is they really increase the, the property tax base. Does the increased tax base actually create a long-term benefit for the growth in the community? It does, and, and again, one of the benefits of it is you've got to remember the strain on uh, our government for these type of renewable project. We don't have to provide fancy roads, a lot of police and fire protection. They provide a very good tax base, which in turn goes into our general fund, which keeps our local residents' general taxes on their properties tremendously low. Which as may well attract as, new business. As, as well as, as the, exactly. the, school, the school district. And the school district. And I mean, you know, we've got, we've got some of the, we, for a little small com, a county of like Beaver, uh, we've, got, we've got some of the finest schools in the country and some of the finest curriculums uh, because of the tax base of this. Okay, well let me point a question to you, Jim. We've got, you know, we've got the, we've got geothermal a little bit, we've got some solar projects underway, we've got first wind completed with phase two, is that correct? Um, and so what is the emerging energy, what is the full potential out here? Well, uh, one, I may give a segue for Brian towards, uh, that's important is to also recognize, as an example for wind, uh, with the basin and range valleys that we're out with here in the West Desert, the winds are steady, there's big energy, the larger blade sweep you get. First wind is actually, with their latter phase work, looked at larger turbines, bigger sweep areas to generate more electricity for the same relative plant cost. Right. Uh, so that's a realm, the geothermal that I mentioned earlier, where there's a, there's a geologic reservoir that's uh, thick with limestone, 4,000 feet thick at 8,000 feet. It's uh, 60 or 70 miles long, 11 to 12 miles wide. Could provide a huge potential for geothermal uh, with some pretty interesting modeling that the geological survey is involved with. So as an example, the Utah Geological Survey the Bureau and the industry were trying to see what we can do to actually test that reservoir. Uh, the solar side of the house, uh, we have yet on the public lands to actually have any large utility scale solar, although there have been smaller PV projects that are in play here. But in the potential here in the, uh, the southern part of the West Desert is we've got about 1.8 million acres of land out here that has, can generate enough solar electricity in addition to powering this studio uh, to, to provide utility scale solar. So it is huge. It's a matter of economy, like uh, Brian had mentioned. Thank you for joining us on the county seat. If you'd like a little more information about this or relate the show to a friend, go to our website, thecountyseat.tv. You can find our Facebook link there. That's where we get your dialogue back. I'd love to hear from you and hear some of your comments on this program. Thanks for watching the county seat. We'll see you next week. Remember, local government is where your life happens. Become involved. Thank you for watching.